not real excited about preaching today's message. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, we're in Revelation. We're still doing the letters to the, the various churches. Uh, just as a quick reminder, uh, so John the Revelator, as they would like to refer to him, uh, wrote the book of Revelation when he was on in exile on the island of Patmos. Uh, he does the churches in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. So we did Ephesus. We did Smyrna. Today we're going to do uh, Pergamum. Uh, and we're going to talk about that and that city and what that mean. Uh, and so prepping this week and looking at that this this week has not been a fun time. So before we jump into all of it and we talk about it, um, here's what I want to clarify and make very um, forthright and transparent. This message is as much to me as it is to you. I in no way think I have figured everything out and have uh, a grasp on perfect holiness or perfect righteousness. But as your pastor and as someone who feels like God has put a calling on their life to preach and teach, I refuse to um, compromise on some things because I feel like it's important we stay true to the gospel. And so today's message is one of those ones that uh, might be rough, but it's necessary for the church to grow and do what it needs to do. And so that's what we're going to do because there are set things that are a part of Christianity that are just a part of Christianity, and if we don't like them, we just don't like them, but they're still a part of Christianity. Uh... I love chocolate chip cookies. So, uh, chocolate chip cookies have a set recipe you have to go by. And with the invention of the internet, you can search the best chocolate chip cookie recipe, and then you can pull up hundreds of thousands of pages with different recipes for the best chocolate chip cookies, which obviously this is now subjective. But the one thing is true is you have to follow the recipe to get what you want. We were helping one time at a nursing home in Lincoln. And we went in and walked into this room. And you ever, you ever see chocolate chip cookies? Listen, there's a difference between when you buy like Nestle Toll House cookies, you know, like pothead cookies, those ones that you like slice and cook in the microwave, and you're like, this will count. The difference between those and, like, the legit chocolate chip that's got, like, the big chunko chocolate in it that you're like, where do you even buy the chunko chocolate? And you see it in your mouth, and you're like, oh, the gates of heaven are in here. Ah. So we walk in this room to touch base with one of the ladies that we always prayed with and said hello to. Her name was Agnes. Agnes was in her 90s. And I said, oh, you got chocolate chip cookies? And she said, I made them for you, hon. And I go, God bless you, Agnes. And so then we walk over, me and my buddy, and we pick a cookie up. And I'm looking at the cookie, and the cookie looks delicious. It looks like how a chocolate chip cookie is supposed to look. There's nothing about the cookie that seems strange or weird until I bit into it. And it was like taking a mouthful of table salt with chocolate chips in it, which is kind of a bittersweet experience. Salty sweet's not bad, but too much salt is a lot. And I said, oh, Agnes, these are great. So we walked out, we took the cookies, didn't want to hurt her feelings, we walked out and I was talking to the nurse and she said, don't eat the cookies. And I said, that would have been good information before we walked in there. She goes, Agnes is blind as a bat, and she can't see, so she just grabs the stuff off the counter and put it in. And so lately, we've been keeping salt next to the sugar in the big thing because they get it in in the kitchen they had for them, and she will use salt as sugar. So enjoy. The recipe matters. And if you, if you add or if you change things or if you just don't use stuff, things will not turn out the way that they're supposed to turn out. Christianity is the same way. We're in Pergamum today. So I wrote down this information because Lord knows I can't remember it off the top of my head. Pergamum is 55 miles north of Smyrna. There's 120,000 people there in the time of John. Uh, and it is famous in this area mostly for its architecture. So they had built all of these huge temples and all this ornate Greek art, and that was all what it was. People would go there to see it. Now, all of that art is built around paganism. So the big ones to talk about, there was a thing called the Zeus Soter, which means the Zeus Savior. 
It was this giant altar. It's 120 feet long by 60 feet wide, which is bigger than this building. And around the bottom of it was Zeus's battle with the old gods that was there. On top of it, they burned a bonfire 24 hours a day. And so when you read about Pergamum and stuff outside of the Bible, one of the things they talk about is you could see the pyre from miles and miles away. You could see this burning fire to Zeus where they would go and offer sacrifice to that. You go a quarter of a mile away from that, there stood a temple to Athena. So you had this wisdom goddess, this knowledge goddess that you could go there and you could worship. You go a quarter mile from that, and there was a temple to Dionysus. Dionysus is the god of revelry, the god of uh, wild frenzy, the god of sexuality. The god, so her temple is the Wild West. Uh, it's so insane and crazy. I don't even want to talk about it. Let's just say it was debauchery central. You could go there for debauchery. That's what that was known for. She's the god of wine and revelry and partying and um, weird sexuality. So that was there. So people would come in to see that. They had a, a large temple dedicated to Caesar Augustus, who was the first Caesar to declare himself God. So they built the first temple then for the worship of the emperor. So that's a part of it. And then the last thing they have is uh, they have the largest temple to Asclepius. Now, Asclepius, if you didn't know, he's still around today. He's the snake god, the god of healing. Yeah, somebody was like, I'm out, stop it. <laughs> if you've ever seen that weird medical symbol that's the rod with the snake wrapped around it, Asclepius, that's what that is. Now, this temple People came from all around here for healing. And what you would do is they, the, the temple was an enclosed building that was full of snakes. They weren't poisonous. It's safe. It's safe. You would go in with your sick person. Imagine like you got a sick child. You don't know what's wrong with your kid. So you show up here. You pay the temple priest for healing, and the temple priest would tell you how long you had to leave your child in the temple. Oftentimes, it was overnight, and then you would strip your child down to his little or her little loincloth, and they would lay flat on their back in this open room and allow the snakes to crawl over your kid, and that brought about healing. Now, the creepy thing and the weird thing about this is for that to have validity... There had to be some things that went on that led people to believe that was actually doing something. So there's also this demonic, satanic aspect to the whole thing going on. All of this paganism and all of this weirdness is the culture that is Pergamum. And if you want to fit in, if you want to be a part then you had to be a part of that. And it was the thing you were raised up in. This wouldn't have felt weird to them because that would have been, this is what's normal. This is what we do. We, we go to Dionysus' temple. We have orgies. We go to the snake god and we put our sick kids on the ground and let the Satan wants crawl across the top of them. This is what we do. This is who we are. If you don't feel good or if you're sick then you go find a god you offer a sacrifice you eat the the food of idols if you have problems in your marriage you go find a temple prostitute this was real pay and have sex with a temple prostitute and that will fix the problems you're having in your marriage somehow like this is a really pagan strange culture and in the midst of that then you have this little church this little church that we don't know much about, the church in Pergamum. The only place it's mentioned in the Bible is in Revelation. Now, we know in Galatians that Paul talks about that he was there and he was preached and everybody in Asia Minor heard the gospel. So it makes sense that these churches have popped up. It makes sense that they're there. But we don't know much about what's going on other than this letter. And this letter is not the letter that you want to get from Jesus. It's just not. Like, when you talked about this to begin with, I said, if you got a letter from Jesus, I know some of you would be like, oh, it's this wonderful. It's right in this letter. To me, I'm like, oh, he is going to know every messed up thing we are doing, and he is not going to be happy about it. Enter this letter, which he starts like this. 
to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. So we're going to get off to a fun start uh, right in the beginning. Essentially, this is what Jesus is doing. Imagine if somebody were to walk in and go, I need to talk to you, and then took a handgun out of their pants and slammed it down on the pulpit. He'd probably listen, right? He'd probably be like, well, this dude means business. What's this sword he's talking about? Well, in Revelation, there's two different words used for a sword. One word is a 12 to 18 inch ceremonial dagger that the Roman guard would carry to say that they had the right for execution. The other word is a a uh, niche sword used by the Greeks. And this thing is wild. It's five foot tall. This tall off the ground. It has a two foot handle with a curved three foot blade that is double that has a blade on both sides. And this thing was designed because the Greeks were losing fights against wood shields. So the ingenuity of man, they made this thing that you could grab it with two hands like a ball bat and it was so powerful that you could cut shields in half. So they would use it to cut the shields in half and then cut you in half. And that's what's coming out of Jesus' mouth. So he's, not, he's letting them know, I know the Romans carry this thing and say they have the right to life and death in their hands, but what I'm telling you is I speak life and I speak death, and today we're going to talk about death which is fun, right? If you're a Pergamum, you're like, well, this is, uh, we're going to pay attention in here to what he has to say, I guess. He goes on to say, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name and you don't deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. A lot of big uh, symbolic words here. Doesn't sound like a fun thing to say. It's interesting, again, that Jesus starts his letter with commendation. These are the things you're doing well. It's also interesting that he starts it with, I know. I know where you're living. I understand what you are in. I understand what is influencing you. I know you are near Satan's throne. We don't know what he's talking about. Is that a physical thing? It might be. Remember, you have a giant altar to Zeus that looks like a throne sitting in the middle of the city that burns fire every day to a false god. You have all these various temples, all of which have things in them and around them that could be construed as an actual throne of Satan. But it also could just be that this city is more corrupt than another city because Satan has taken hold and has his fingers in the middle of it and is excited about what's going on there. He's so excited he's made it the eye of his kingdom. Look how well I'm doing. Look at Pergamum. This is where my throne is. And Jesus knows that, and he knows you're sitting there. That's where you are. He commends them then for not denying their faith in the midst of that, that you're right here in the middle of this great, the tempter is amongst you, and you've held fast your faith, even when they killed Antipas. Well, who's that? We don't know. Most scholars will tell you he probably is the pastor of the church, and he's probably executed because of the various reasons they were executing Christians at the time. So he probably refused to give a uh, Credence to Caesar Augustus as God. He may have refused to do sacrifices to the gods. He may have said there are no gods. We don't know what he did, but it caught him and caused him death. Now, church history says how he was killed, and you can go see this today. We, we have it. See, they came up with this idea that you could take a bull, you could shape a bull out of iron, and you could put various tubes throughout it, and various things in it that you could put a human being inside of this thing and then start a fire underneath of it. And as you slowly cooked the guy to death, as he screamed, it made cow noises out the top of it. And that's what they did to Antipas, is what church history says. Because he wouldn't compromise on his faith. He wouldn't give on it. And in the midst of that, Jesus says, I know you've held fast and you have not forsaken and you've not walked away even to sit and face that. Again, I say to you, we as Christians have no concept of persecution. We have no concept of putting your feet to the fire. What happens if your pastor gets set on fire in an iron bowl and burned to death while everybody dances around them in the nude? I mean, do you show up at church the next Sunday? Well, there's no one to preach. I can still smell Antipas. Like, what do you do? And yet, 
That's what they've done, and that's who they are. And so Jesus wants to say to them, before we get into what we need to deal with, before we talk about the problems, before we discuss why I brought a gun to this fight, we need to first connotate and say to you, I get it, and I know where you're at. I know what you're walking through. I know what you've seen, and I want to commend you that in the face of such adversity, you've stood still and held the course. The same is true of you in America, in this world we live in. We don't face persecution, but we do face compromise more than we ever have in history. This country's idea of tolerance and what's acceptable and what you can do is a watering down of the gospel. And we have to talk about it because if we water down the gospel, then you end up with salt cookies that are inedible, that nobody wants. So where does he go? Well, this is what he says next. I have a few things against you. Never what you want to hear Jesus say. You have some there who hold the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So you also have some who hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. So what's he talking about? Well, first we get to talk about Balaam and Balak. If you know the Balaam story, it's hilarious. I'm not going to read it all to you today, but if you want to, it's in Numbers 23 through 25. It's all of those chapters. Uh, there's a great part where uh, there's a talking, talking donkey. Uh, can't make that up. So if you're interested in talking donkeys, there you go. Essentially, Balaam is a prophet in the Old Testament. Balak is the Moabite king. He goes to Balaam and tells Balaam, I want you to curse the Israelites. Because he's sitting in Moab, and he's looking across the river, and he can see this giant tribe of Israelites, and he's scared. He's like, these guys, this is, this is bad news bears. We've got to do something about this. So he goes to Balaam. He's like, you've got you to go curse these guys. So they don't, they're going to come over here and look at all of them. So Balaam, through the course of those chapters, is like, I'm going to curse him. And then God keeps confusing him, and then he keeps blessing him. So he has to keep going back to Balak and going, ah, I tried to curse him, but I may have actually blessed him. Well, that's not what I said for you to do. I know, but there's this donkey that keeps, it's a mess. So then Balaam goes, but you know what, listen, I don't think we can pray a curse on them. But we can do this. I've been looking around your camp, Balak, and you got some smoke show Moabite women here. Send them over to the camp to seduce the Israelite men. And then we can just interbreed our paganism into what they're doing, and it'll compromise the whole thing, and then it won't be a problem. So Balak does just that. So, and then the Jewish people, they turn their backs on what Christ tells them to do. He turned their back on being sexually pure. They turn their back on keeping it within Israelite ranks and, and within the tribe and being just those chosen people. And they start to sleep with these Moabite women. And it makes God so mad, he kills 24,000 of them. Welcome to the Old Testament. So when Jesus talks to this group, he goes, there's some of you who hold the teachings of Balaam, meaning that you have people within your congregation, you have people who are a part of what you're doing, who are telling you that the thing that is sin, the thing that is wrong is not sin, and in fact, you should be doing it. And it's going to be okay. And he mentions two things. What's he say? The eating of the food of idols and sexual immorality. Those two go hand in hand. What are they? Well, in these temples, they would offer food as sacrifice. But they never would like go in and just burn up the whole thing. It was always just a little piece of whatever. So if you brought a hunk of lamb in, they'd cut a small piece off and they would burn it. And then that meat that was left over, they would give to the priests of that temple and then the priests could do it as they saw fit. And they would do one of two things. Now one thing they would do was they would take the meat sometimes just out into the market and sell it. And Paul says, you can eat that meat. If you buy former idol meat, that's fine. But then sometimes they would take it and they would prepare, prepare feasts within the temple that they would then invite people as if the God of the temple invited them. So Dionysus has invited you to come eat and be a part of her feast. And they would cook this meat and they would eat it and then they would do all sorts of strange debauchery around it. The church in Pergamum is participating in this. They're doing this thing still because it's tradition in their culture. This is what we do. It's not a big deal. It's, not, it's okay. 
We're just going to go down there and do that. We may sleep with a temple prostitute every now and then. No big deal. And they've got people within the congregation who are telling them that's okay. And again, we're talking about the Nicolaitans. And again, I have to tell you, we're not real sure what they taught, but it was enough that Jesus said in the last letter, or the, in Ephesus letter, that he hates what they teach. So there's this compromise inside of it. Now, you may hear that and go, what does that have to do with us here this morning? There's no temple in this town where you can go have weird orgies and eat barbecue. But listen, Christians, you got to wake up and not be dumb about the world we live in. Which brings me to the point this morning that God's just laid on my heart all week long, and I've not really wanted to talk about it, but I think it needs to address. you got so many Christians in this world that just go, I don't know why God doesn't move the way he used to, and I don't understand why God doesn't do the things that he, and I don't, where is God in this, and why isn't there a revival, and why won't God do the things? We, we don't preach sin. We don't preach sin. We are scared to death to confront sin issues in this world. Well, what if you hurt somebody's feelings? What if you offend somebody? You can't talk about certain sins because you don't know what they've walked through. And you can't have an opinion because you haven't experienced it. And we don't want to run somebody off. And they need to know God's grace and God's mercy. They need to know God's wrath. They need to understand by you continuing to do things that the Bible clearly teaches is sin, what you are saying is that what you accomplished on the cross, what you have for me, the definition that you have for me is not as great as the thing that I hold near and dear. The truth about sin is this. We oftentimes as Christians want to pretend that people who do sin are like nefarious Dr. Evils who run around and like, ha, 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 watch me break the rules. When the truth of the matter is it's a lot of hurt, broken people who are continuing to do the thing that they used to do in in hopes that that will make them happy and they'll get a different result than what they had. People do things that are not beneficial to them, not because they're evil, but because they're broken. And as if Christians, if we don't teach that, if we don't talk about, listen, your broken nature is driving you into death and into destruction, into loneliness and pain and separation, and you're clinging to that. If we don't teach that, then who's evil? That nurse that didn't tell me there was salt in that cookie was evil. She knew the thing was messed up. She didn't say anything. She went in there and let us take bites of salt cookies. Now, if we really believe that Jesus Christ died and resurrected for the forgiveness of sin, then why don't we talk sin? Why are we afraid to talk about things that are sin? Sexual immorality is sin. If you have sex outside of marriage, you are in sin. If you are in a homosexual relationship, that is sin. If you are in a bicurious relationship, if you're in a pansexual relationship, if you're in a look at me, I'm insane and I like trees relationship, it's sin. Well, but why would God give us these emotions and these feelings? If it, he didn't. The broken of this world did. Greed is sin. Power hungry is sin. Gossip is sin. And all of these things that come through, if we don't talk about it, if we don't tell people, if we don't say like, listen, this stuff is sin. If we don't do that, then what we do is we take God and we put Him in a box because God is righteous and those, those things are unrighteous and they can't be in the same spot. You wonder why there's no revival? You don't want to wake up out of your death state. We'd rather argue and get bristly and get up, oh, you're just being mean and hateful and you don't understand what I'm going through. Please, I'm a sinner too. I get it. I understand. Right? You get hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Holt, do you have any of those emotions? The first thing you run to usually is something you shouldn't be running to. Because you've trained your brain, you've trained your mind. These are the things that I should do. If I do this, then I'll be happy. If I have this, then this will work out. I have to do that. You don't understand what it's like. You can feel it in the Scripture this morning, in the text. You have these people who are living in this city that are going, but if we don't do these things, then people aren't going to like us. Do you know how many edge kids I had say to me when I'm like, look, you can't have sex till you get married. And they would go, if I don't have sex, then they won't love me. Baby, if, you, if that's how they love you, then they don't love you. That isn't love. 
If you're a child of the king bought with a price and he calls you to sexual purity and puts sex in the confines of marriage and you convey that to a person that that's who you are and they tell you to compromise that, that person doesn't care about who you are. Period. You don't understand love. No, I do. It's sacrifice. It's what Christ did for us. In spite of us being sinners, he died and gave his life so we could live. The same is true across all of the board. Well, if I don't have the information to tell people, then no one will talk to me. I have to have the scoop. If I don't talk about these people and let people know what's going on, then how will anybody ever find out about the things that they've done? It's not your place. You're a gossip and a backbiter. And you're causing division in the church and people are afraid of you. Because you talk about them behind their back. And they, they have ill will. They want to hurt you. And honestly, I get it. I mean, the truth of the matter is what Christ did and what Christ came to do was to call people free from sin. I mean, Jesus could have left it at this, right? He could have been like, hey, listen, you, uh, you guys are compromising all of this stuff. I brought the sword today to solve the problem. We could have gone Old Testament. He could have been like, and that's why in the letter I'm letting you know I've got my giant sword used to cut people in half, and I've come just to cut you in half. But he doesn't do that. Just like he doesn't do to us. What's he say? Therefore, repent. Repent. If not, I'll come to you soon and war against them with the swords of my mouth. If you don't repent, I'm going to come for you and you're going to stand accountable for it. If you don't stop doing it, you're going to have to give an account for why you did it. But I'm telling you right now, repent. This is done in love. I mean, stop and put the gospel in perspective. Think about what we're even talking about here. God creates man and woman, puts them in the garden, gives them jobs, gives them each other, puts them in a relationship, is in communion with them, loves them, and pronounces the whole thing good. Says, this is what we are to do. This is who we are to be. This is what we are. Our relationship is symbiotic. I need you. You need me. You need to be in relationship with me. I created you to worship me. And because of my deep love for you, then I am here with you. And in the midst of that, mankind sought to do their own thing. We don't need you to still have all the glory and all the thing that we already have. Look how great we are. We'll eat from this tree and then we'll have your knowledge and then we don't need you. And it breaks creation. It breaks creation, and you go, well, how does it break creation? Look around. Look at the deconstruction of identity in the world we live in. Nobody knows who they are anymore. We can't even give definitions. We don't know. What are you? Hmm. Today, I don't know. Well, where does that come from? Sin. That comes from the idea that as we remove our identity in Christ and we're left to our own devices and what we're left with, who knows what you're going to come up with? And if we really believe the gospel and really believe the truth of Jesus Christ, then what you are saying is these sin things, these are leading you astray. They're compromising what we have. They're, they're taking the power and the authority of the church and they're removing it. Now, if you're the church, if you are Christ in culture, if you're in the world, but not of the world, then what you need to be able to do is say, this thing that you are doing, this thing that you are attracted to, is leading to your destruction. It's never going to give you what you are hoping it will give you. It's a lie from the enemy. Well, if I, if I just have enough money, then I'll be happy. Do you know most school shooters come out of highly affluent areas? It's weird. Do you know that people who make over $200,000 a year are more likely to be on antidepressants than those who make under? That's weird. See, money and greed and the pursuit of power, that doesn't make you happy. It just makes you want more. 
these things that are built into our society that we feel like we have to have, that we have to do, that we have to engage in are just lies of the enemy to keep you away from what is the truth. And the truth is you are designed with a purpose and with meaning and with reason. You're created in the image of God. You're sacred. And you're supposed to live your life in a reflection of that. But we're broken and we've been led astray by sin. And so God calls to all of us, repent. Come forth to the cross of Jesus Christ. Lay down at the altar the things that you've done wrong. Confess your sin and become like me. Be set free once and for all from this thing that's leading to your death and destruction. And if you don't do that, I am coming with a sword in my mouth to wage war on those who won't. And that's the Gospel. And I know it's not fun. I know it's not where you're like, man, I just, this was uplifting. I feel good. But it should be uplifting because what it says is you're not stuck where you are at. See, this world doesn't like the idea that you can change. We don't like it. Don't know. People, people are who they are. Let people be who they are. No. Because who they are is broken by sin and it's not their true identity. It's not their true definition. It's interesting where he goes on in this. He says this. He says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. And I'll give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. So first, he's going to give you the hidden man. And now if you don't know Old Testament, what happens in the Old Testament is when they leave Egypt out of the Exodus and they're wandering around, they don't have any food. And so God sends manna from heaven. This is some sort of heavenly bread that feeds the Israelites when they're wandering in the desert. It's how they survived while they're out there. And when they put the Ark of the Covenant together, which is where God resides in the Old Testament for sacrifice, they put some of that manna in it and they referred to it as the hidden manna. Now what Jesus is saying is, I will feed you. I will provide for you. I will give you what you have need of when you have need of it. How much sin is just the excess of you not trusting God's going to give you what you need? Well, I, 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 need a, I want a spouse. You don't under, I'm lonely. I'm, huh? I, I want people to like me. I want, then you need Jesus and you need to allow Christ to provide that thing for you. And if people reject you with Christ, then they need Jesus too. But your identity does not come from them. Your value and worth doesn't come from them. Your value and worth comes from Him. And He will feed you and He will provide for you so that He can give you a white stone. And this is the most confusing thing when you study these letters. No one is real sure what the white stone is. Now I can tell you in history, here's what some of the white stones were used for. When they would send out the invites to these feasts of the God, they would write it on a white stone. They would carve it in. An invitation from the god Dionysus. Here's your invitation. When they would have Olympic Games, whoever won got a white stone that said, I am the winner. I have conquered that which no one thought I could conquer. I have overcome that thing that I couldn't overcome. We don't know if that's what Jesus is saying. What we do know is when you move on here, it says, and I will give you a new name that no one knows. He's going to what? Redefine who you are. See, oftentimes we have this talk about sin and then it descends into behavior modification. People hear it and go, oh great, here it is. It's just a church banging the drum that I'm not supposed to have sex and I'm not supposed to be an addict and I'm not supposed to be mean and I'm not, and then I just got to make a checklist and I got to check this stuff off and if I can't hit the checklist and I'm not going to measure up and so three front months from now, I'm going to be so mad at the church and so mad at God and so mad at that fat pastor that I'm never showing back up again. Except that's not what this text says. What this text says is, your sin has condemned you to death, and if you don't repent, I'm going to pour my wrath out upon you. But if you do repent, if you do overcome, if you do come back, then I'm going to feed you. I'm going to provide for you, and I'm going to make you a new thing. When you say to me, I can't change, I agree. You can't. Left to my own devices, I am an introvert, I'm mean as a snake, and I'm probably going to say something that's going to make you cry. That's who Pat Edrington is. I'm selfish, self-focused, self-motivated, I don't think about other people, and I'm insensitive. But that's not the definition that Jesus has given me. But that's who I am. That's the mark of sin I carry. So if I want to be different than that, i got two choices, right? Behavior modification, where I just pretend try to play games, but what do they say? Leopards don't change their spots. Put the cat in the cage and watch what happens. Or, I submit. I submit my will, my desire, my wants, my needs to the cross. And if I do that, 
He gives me a new name. He makes me a new thing. See, the calling here this morning to holiness is not a calling to say never sin again. The calling is to recognize sin is keeping you from knowing and experiencing the God who made you. And if that is true, then each of us every day should have some moment where we find an altar before the Lord and we confess that sin. We lay that thing out. We get honest about like, look, this thing, this drive inside of me I know is not of you and it's keeping me from what I have for you and I want to be free from it and I don't know how to get free from it. So here I am again, contrite and laid down in front of your cross begging you to forgive me and begging you to make me into a new thing. I am at war within myself. It's why Paul wrote that daily you should arise and put to death yourself and take up the cross of Jesus and follow after me. You are at war inside of yourself to be what Christ wants you to be. And the enemy of this world is like Balaam. He wants to stand alongside of you and go, hey, it's not a big deal. It's okay. Grace is sufficient. He loves you. You can keep doing that thing. That's all right. Hey, the Bible's old. It's archaic. That doesn't mean the same thing it meant then that it means now. You can keep doing that thing. This is different. They didn't do then what we're doing now. This love conquers all. All of these things, and it's all lies from the pit of hell. You know what conquers everything? Jesus Christ. And he's coming, seated on a white horse with fire in his eyes and a sword coming out of his mouth to judge a church well whether or not they saw fit to lay dead their sins at the foot of his cross or to stand in defiance and say, we will be who we want to be. You want to have that fight? Feel free. But what I'm telling you is Jesus came to the show this morning with a gun on the altar and said, hey, you want to condemn yourself to death? I'll be happy to send you that way. We're on one hand sad. We're on one hand lonely. We're on one hand depressed and upset. And on the other hand, You have a Father in heaven who's good and loving and righteous who is saying to you, lay down your sins and come after me. Follow after me. Take up this cross. Be like me. And we stand in the middle of that and we just vacillate because on one hand, we love sin. We love these things that we get to do. We love the way it makes us feel. But on the other hand, we desire to know God. And what I'm telling you this morning, there has to be a moment of reckoning where you decide from here on out, I'm going to put this down and I'm going to take up the cross of Jesus and be like Him. Church, you want revival? then seek Christ. Seek Christ. Stop trying to justify the sin in your life. Stop trying to say the thing you're doing is okay. Recognize what you're doing is falling short and ask God to make you into a new thing. And when He does, the world will wake up and pay attention. The world will wake up and go, hey, how come they're overcoming addiction down there? How come their marriages are working at that church? How come they are helping so many people? What's going on there? And you get to say, hey, it's not that we're preaching God's your best friend and everything's going to work out. We're preaching repent for the forgiveness of sins. So this morning we're going to do something a little different than we've done before. We're going to go into a time of worship, but some of you in this room need to make your way to this altar. And you need to get contrite before the God who created you. You need to lay down the mess you're carrying and the baggage that you have. And you may go, well, then everybody's going to know I'm a sinner. Baby, we already do. Everybody knows in this room. And if you're going to sit in your seat and pretend, oh, I'm Pastor Pat. (sighs) I'm not. The Spirit resides on my shoulders. Right down here is the pride spot for you. He doesn't. Nobody's better than anybody else. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And when you see somebody make a march down and make a stand and say, I'm not going to be defined any longer by the sin of the world and the evilness of this world that's trying to convince me to be something I'm not, your heart should not go to a place of gossip and backbiting and judgment. Your heart should break when you watch somebody get right before Jesus Christ. That is the heart of the gospel, and that's who you should be. So we go into worship this morning. Some of you need to do that. Some of you can go to the back and do it when you take communion. Do you know that every week when you take communion, that's what you're supposed to be doing? You take that cracker and it's supposed to be a representation of the body of Christ that was broken for your sin. So when you take that cracker, you're supposed to remind yourself, man, this was who I was. This is who I am. Addicted to these things that are not what God has for me. And I know that when Christ had died, He was able to overcome that thing. He was make me more than a conqueror. So I'm going to take this cracker. I'm going to eat it in remembrance of what He has done. That He has done the impossible and called me out of darkness. Given me a white stone and a new name. But He doesn't leave you there. 
That's why you drink the cup of grape juice. That cup of grape juice represents the blood of Jesus Christ. That means that you are in a constant state of covering. He says in this letter that you are in a city with the throne of Satan. Meaning that there is an evil spiritual presence in this world that wants to destroy you. When you take that red cup of grape juice, you are symbolically saying that in that metaphysical realm, in that spiritual existence, you are covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. The same Jesus who has a sword in His mouth and fire in His eyes that the demons tremble at the mention of His name. When they look at you, when the evil sees you coming, they don't see who you were. They see Christ's blood upon you and they flee in fear. Your definition is that thing. You are not garbage. You are not trash. You are not failing. You are a shield bearer for the very Messiah of humanity. And when you take that cup, that's what you're saying. I'm not the broken mess that I was with this cracker. This is who I am now. So Jesus, remind me of that week, of that this week. When I get hungry, when I get angry, when I get lonely, when I get tired, instead of driving me to my sin issues, instead of driving me to frustration and anger and pain where I'm arguing with God, drive me to the foot of the cross. Bring me back to this place and redefine me again. Break me upon your altar and rebuild me into what it is you want me to be. Give me another white stone. Tell me my new name. Make me a new thing. I am not sinful, broken mess. I am Jesus Christ personified as He dwells upon my shoulder in this world. That's what the church is called to preach. That's what the church has for you. And when you vacillate and you stay away from it, that's what you are missing. Church, we need to repent. Let's pray. Lord, I come to you this morning and in your spirit, in your power, and in your authority, the hard hearts of this world, the walls and the protection that we've built around ourselves, those secrets that we keep on the inside, Lord, I pray this morning that your cross would be a hammer to those things. That in just this body, Lord, you would crush whatever sin issue has arisen. Lord, if we have things in, in the midst of us that we don't know about that are keeping us from experiencing more of you, that are keeping us from seeing you work and move in this city, then Lord, I pray today that it wouldn't be a time of anger. It wouldn't be a time of frustration or, or wanting to fight or argue why you're right or justification, but it would be a time of repentance. Lord, draw us out of the darkness. Raise us up as a church that preaches sin. Raise us up as a church that preaches definitive right and definitive wrong. Make us advocates for absolute truth. Make us into what you've called us to be. Let us stand in the face of adversity, facing the throne of Satan, loudly proclaiming the power and the authority of the cross of Jesus Christ. We are conquerors of death because you have conquered death. We are voice of logic and reason in a society lost in darkness. Pour your spirit out into this room and into this city and save people from the things that they think they can't overcome. Lord, we pray against the spirit of Balaam. We pray against the idea that justification is okay. We know you have defined who it is we are called to be. We know you have given us a new name. And Lord, we pray that and believe that over every person in this room this morning. Lord, we'll no longer be defined by what we were. We will be defined by who you are. And when we look at each other and when we hold steadfast to the cross of Jesus, we will proclaim that over everybody. And when we stumble, when we fall, we will run to your altar and we will get contrite before you. We will lay flat on the floor and beg forgiveness so that your spirit is free to move through your church. We want redemption, we want reconciliation, we want restoration, and for that to happen, Lord, help us to kill our sacred cows in our life, these things that we cling to that are living, leading us to nothing more than death. We are not slaves to our sin. We are slaves to you. 
So lay bare our weakness. Lord, this morning as we go back to take communion, I pray that would be a spiritual experience for each and every person who takes it. That they will be able to take that cracker and lay down what they were and take that grape juice and become a representation of what you are. Set us free and then set us loose. Use us in this world to reach those who are broken. Use us to preach the gospel. Raise us up. Let us rub people the wrong way. Let us be bold and forthright about our faith. Lord, what the sun sets free is free indeed. And we pray and believe that this morning. It's in your gracious name that we pray. Amen.